Okay, everybody, I'm going to get us started. Um, first of all, thank you for joining us for this special evening at Skidaway event. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Skidaway Institute of Oceanography for allowing us to co host this special event tonight. Um, my name is Emily Kimberly. I'm the public relations coordinator with the University of Georgia Money Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, our mission is to improve the environmental, social, and economic health of the coast through research, education, and outreach. And here on Skidaway Island, we share this campus with Skidaway Institute. We actually operate two facilities out here. We have the UGA Shellfish Research Lab, which is adjacent to this building, and we have the UGA Marine Education Center and Aquarium, um, which we'll be visiting later tonight to see this special exhibit by Barbara Mann who I'll get to next. Um, Barbara is an Athens-based metal artist who is an awardee of our Artist Writers and Scholars program. This is a year-long program where we fund Georgia artists across the state to create work that inspires people to appreciate coastal resources and coastal cultures. So we're very excited to have her talk about her project tonight. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to her. Well, first of all, thank you everybody very much for coming. And I know that's kind of a strange topic. <laughs> um, and thank you for having me at Skidaway. It's a very beautiful place and everybody has been so generous with me and I really appreciate it. Um, so again, I'm gonna talk about metal artist view of the marine carbon cycle. And um, I have been interested in natural things and uh, nature for most of my art career, like many artists are interested in um, nature. So to create is to connect. And this grant project has connected me to a lot of wonderful people, to ideas and information, and has encouraged me to connect the dots between different topics, different themes. So I'm going to give you a little background of how I got to thinking about the marine carbon cycle. Um, Again, I've been interested in the natural world. This was inspired by uh, the Japanese printmaker Hokusai, and it's called The Great Wave. And um, I did this a long time ago, so I've been interested in, again, marine things. And first of all, I'm an artist, I'm not a scientist. And so my reading about the marine carbon cycle is from um, many different sources written for the lay person. And so I've taken that information and tried to incorporate it into artwork that tells the story of the big picture and sometimes the little pictures. This is one of my favorite uh, images of looking at little things. So cell biology I've often been interested in. This is quite an old piece, but um, uh, made with silver and gemstones. So I work mostly in, in metal, incorporating other materials with it. And generally, when you're working with uh, metal, you are fabricating, which is taking sheet metal and cutting it, bending it, hammering it, texturing it, or casting. So casting is taking metal and melting it and um, into molds. So I tend to kind of work in an assembly way so that I'm fabricating and casting. Um, this is um, like a Petri dish with cells coming and reaching, uh, nerve cells reaching to each other, kind of based on um, the Sistine Chapel with Adam giving life um, to man. And then uh, diamonds and rubies to innervate, to give life, to give life force. Um, cloning back, I can't remember when Dolly was, many years ago. And um, so again, uh, this is, you know, the when was Dolly? No, I oh, I early, yeah. early, okay. Um, so this was cloning, which interested me. And so this is Dolly the sheep with um, the pearls representing eggs. And again, a lot of art is metaphor. And I look at my work and I think it's, um, I use materials to suggest something. So in this case, the pearls suggesting eggs. Um, this is called a cistrum. And it was used by the Greek muses to stir up life. So when things got boring, you take this rattle and shake it and say, everything's going to be different. So kind of a handy tool to have around. And so again, this was um, cloning of calves, which came after Dolly was um, calves. And so this is kind of shaking up the 
world order. New information. This is a piece, good luck to stem cell research. And um, my husband, Bill, and I, who are here, and my friend, Nancy, we've often gone to Cortona, Italy, and have taught there many times uh, with the UJ Studies Abroad. So Italian imagery is important and part of my life. And I grew up in Italy also. Um, it's a, this Cornato is good luck. Some people have said, oh, that's raise hell. And then, no, it's good luck to stem cells. And uh, kind of the uh, branch of, again, life, the coral and the red being energy. It's a football symbol in Texas. Oh, it's long <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh. Well, football players sometimes have um, injuries and they might need some stem cell yes, stuff. Is. So uh, this piece is at the Mint Museum and it's in a show right now called Craft in the Lab. So if you're in Charlotte, it's on display and I'm, that makes me very happy. Uh, another piece that is um, research mice as saints. So those are mice skulls with their little halos and um, Petri dishes, or Petri stirrers hanging down to refer to a lab. Um, evolution has interested me, and I read a lot about Darwin and um, evolution, origins of life. I find a fascinating topic, you know, the primordial soup that we saw earlier. And so this is evolution with a T-Rex. He's in trouble, and there's a bird looking at him saying, okay, I'm taking over. <laughs> So uh, again, sort of the opal kind of suggesting water and things growing out of the water. Uh, the peridot, algae, you know, source of life like the phytoplankton. Um, and on an obsidian base, which is volcanic. Um, another bird and dinosaur with a tektite, so an outer space meteorite. He's grabbing on because the whole idea of panspermia, that things came from outer space, like disease came from outer space, or different um, beginnings of sparks of life maybe came from outer space, and meteors are in diamond inclusions. So that's, that's what this piece is about. Uh, again, the um, meteorite coming uh, in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, to wipe out the dinosaurs. And this is done with cuttlefish, which is a technique um, that is in the exhibit that you'll see. So cuttlefish is a cephalopod. They're beautiful and change color, and they're magical creatures. But when they have a skeleton that is um, porous, and it washes up on the beach, and you can carve into it and um, pour metal into it and uh, get that shape. Or you can make sheets of it. So this is a cuttlefish body that I've poured metal into and then impressed uh, the dinosaurs, and again, um, pterodactyls that are going to take over the dinosaurs, and a meteorite, and um, more life force, that blood ruby. Life on Mars. Um, so this is, again, the cuttlefish texture, which you can see, and um, the red planet Mars, and a meteorite, and a trilobite um, suggesting beginnings of life. A meteorite necklace, again, cuttlefish, and that doesn't look like it's very clear. I think I did not get the best quality slide for that image. I apologize. Um, so that has a ruby, a slice of ruby, uh, and these are meteorites. Those are actual meteorites that are cast with silver around them and some gold bezels and, um, again, things coming from outer space to enter our atmosphere. Um, this is called Walk in the Georgia Woods. So this is a, um, a series where I was interested in thinking about wood and trees. And um, a neighbor of ours cut down a huge oak uh, for lumber. And it, you know, it was very upsetting. And I tried to, oh, you know, please stop. But no, tree's gone. And um, so this is my homage to a tree. I go for a walk every day in the woods and come home and put some little treasure in there, a snail or whatever. So, there's a little gold snail on the bottom, um, a, a mouse bone in gold, some oak um, acorns, and then acorn leaves, leaves etched at the top. Uh, more wood, same thing, a um, little container to hold acorn, an heirloom oak seed, 
And uh, this is a technique called metal mosaic. It's silver and copper together um, with an oak branch cast and peridot, again, for photosynthesis and color and um, chlorophyll. So I am going to stop here and read an artist statement. So um, for most art exhibits, an artist has to sit, submit a written artist statement of what you're thinking about at the moment. And you know, usually I'll use an artist statement for a couple of years or when I'm thinking about one theme. And so for about maybe three years, I was just thinking about wood and how does photosynthesis happen? How, how do we breathe? How does that all work? And I realized way over my head, very complicated, um, but I can read about it. So I'm going to read you my artist statement. <clears throat> I'm amazed by the complexity and beauty of the natural wor world. My ongoing series of work is focused on the origins of life on Earth, evolution, and the carbon cycle. As a jeweler and metalsmith, I'm fascinated with materials and processes. I'm inspired by new scientific discoveries and technologies that are changing what we know and how we view life on Earth. A walk in the woods um, is a pleasure and a mystery. In an effort to make sense of the complexity and chaos of the natural world, I create objects that are a distilled metaphoric expression of observation and idea. I don't fully understand a tree's photosynthesis, but I can observe the tree, read about the process, and visualize the various elements coming together to tell a story in a tangible object such as a vase or a necklace. This process of integrating knowledge and observation with making an object keeps me looking, keeps me thinking, and keeps me happy. So that's, that's my, <laughs> my whole um, thinking about this making art. OK, the reference to uh, the tree's photosynthesis is how I became interested in the marine carbon cycle. This is another sunlight in the trees. Uh, and this is carbon with different elements and necklace. Uh, so the central part there is the uh, cambrium lay layer of a pine tree. And then the blue topaz is water dripping off. Um, and <clears throat> to the left is a carbon molecule. And you can see the kind of lattice work of a carbon molecule and going clockwise around. And the next is a piece of uh, Whitby jet. So um, wood that's been compressed for a long time and, and um, kind of the, what's doing making fossil fuels. The next is a rutilated quartz, which is my, um, always my go-to for representing the sun. And another carbon molecule, some branches and carbon carbon, a little bit of coral that's molded. And again, that's coral that's been molded and um, cast into silver. Let's see. Another carbon necklace. And again, you can read that, um, the carbon, the branches, and um, what else? There's some different leaves, some succulents, and some other branches. This is COVID. So then COVID happens, and everybody is doing different things. And um, I switched to thinking about again, photosynthesis, and kept reading. Most of the photo, or half of the photosynthesis that happens um, on Earth in our uh, lives comes from marine life, from marine carbon, marine life photosynthesizing. And that we get 50% uh, of the air we breathe from plants and 50% from the ocean. So I, think, I keep reading this, I, I don't understand um, this marine carbon cycle. So I started reading this book, Symphony and Sea, Robert Hazen. It was fabulous. I, I recommend that book to everybody. It just very, again, I'm reading on a very elementary level for the lay person. But he goes through um, carbon on a short cycle and a long cycle. And that carbon cycling, you know, as we expire and breathe, but it's also cycling into the water, into all of the creatures, and then it's going down to the sediment at the bottom of the ocean, and then it's going down to the middle of the earth, and then it's going to turn into diamonds, and it's going to pop out of a volcano. It just, it's all in there. It's amazing. It's in there. All right, and then this book, um, Art Forms in Nature, Ernst Haeckel. So let's see here. Um, 
I've had this book since I was in high school because he, he was a German um, artist and illustrator. And he's a beautiful, beautiful uh, illustrator. He was a scientist. And he went out on, uh, was he on the Beagle? HMS Beagle, I think. And uh, so he did these drawings of marine life. And so I've, I've drawn these forever. And then all of a sudden, they became much more meaningful to me. So then I read about the uh, Georgia Sea Grant Artist Writers and Scholars Program. And they had a call for applications for a grant. So I applied. And hallelujah, I got it. So I thought, OK, now I'm going to focus on looking at marine life. Um, then came more wonderful connections to the campus here at Skidaway, and Emily Kenworthy arranged for me and my husband Bill, who's here, um, to come to Skidaway and to go to the phytoplankton lab with um, Katie Higgins and all her wonderful volunteers and that whole program, which is just amazing. And they showed me all kinds of wonderful things with a microscope and books to look at and smug mug and so total inspiration. So here are some of the, um, oh, there's, there they are in the lab. That was such a great visit. So this is a um, Cocolithophore, Amaliana huxleyi. So I make this into a wall piece. So let me read you uh, a little bit about that. My representation of these beautiful, delicate marine organisms is composed of abstracted shapes and forms of Cocolithophores made in bronze and silver. Cocolithophores are tiny marine single-celled organisms that are part of the phytoplankton community. Phytoplankton, drifters in water, perform nearly half of the photosynthesis and oxygen production on Earth. They are a crucial part of the marine food web and carbon cycle. Cocolithophores surround themselves with plates, coccoliths. Uh, quote, Cocolithophores make their coccoliths out of uh, one part carbon, one part calcium, and three parts oxygen. So each time a molecule of a coccolith is made, one less carbon atom is al allowed to road freely in the world to form greenhouse gases and contribute to global warming, quote. And that's from the Earth Observatory, NASA. Uh, when the coccolith sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it becomes part of the sediment sequestering carbon. Coccoliths are preserved in a continuous fossil record for the last 200 million years and are used to collect data for climate and ocean studies. The White Cliffs of Dover, a UNESCO heritage site, are the accumulation of coccolithophores over millions of years on the seabed, which became exposed and now is at sea level. So I have a, a necklace that is in the exhibit, and a central um, cabochon stone in there is from the White Cliffs of Dover area. And it's um, fossil ammonites that are really old. I have to look up my notes. 200 million? Something like that. Um, okay, the, um, let's see, where am I? All right, the Ambiliana huxleyi is the most prominent coccolithophore and has attracted the attention of scientists from fields as diverse as geology, biogeography, paleoclimatology, ecophysiology, material science, and medicine. Um, e. huxleyi is also of interest to those in biotechnology. So again, with so many things that I read, have been reading with marine things, there's so many medicines and glues for surgery that all come from the um, toxins and, and uh, elements that are in these amazing creatures. So here is the um, bronze and silver coccolithophore that I made as a wall piece. And um, again, I, the first piece I made out of sheet silver and then would um, solder a wire around the edge and cut each of those little negative spaces out um, and then I made a mold of it and then made that into wax and then cast those pieces so I didn't have to make each one of those elements. So, um, you know, you could make it move a little more uh, quickly. I'd love to make this is a, um, it's in the exhibit here and it is one half of a coccolithophore. Of course, to make it totally in the round would be twice the amount of labor. So I stopped there. But I'd like, it would be wonderful to make a, a 3D and have it hang, like a disco, a disco ball coccolithophore. Um, our, um, coccolithophore E. Huxleyi is named after the scientist Thomas Henry Huxley, who was called Darwin's bulldog. 
So I thought that was good to know for UGA. <laughs> All right, and this is um, a drawing. These are the drawings from um, Ernst Haeckel, and you can see how they're amazing, but he's looking at it as a scientist, but boy, was he an artist. So I made a necklace that is this um, lower uh, phytoplankton that looks like palm, a palm tree to me. Uh, so my phytoplankton pendant and necklace are a representation of two phytoplankton. And help me with the pronunciation, Katie. Uh, you can't be a zodiacus, okay? Close enough. Okay. And Lycmorphora flabellate. Close enough? Yeah, I wouldn't even pronounce Okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you tell me? Is that? I have no idea. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. Two different, two different kinds of phytoplankton. Okay, um, let's see, where are we? Okay, here's the necklace. And this is made of silver, gold, diamonds, and opal. The necklace is composed of the neck, you know, that it's hanging on. The necklace part is, is uh, pure carbon diamond beads. And um, they signify the crucial role plankton play in the carbon cycle. The green diamonds refer to photosynthesis, and the opal in the middle suggests water and air. So that, again, that's um, the outside is a one plankton and the inside is Hankel, reference to his. And I believe um, one of the women in the photoplankton lab have, has a tattoo that is of that, which is great. <laughs> okay, um, that same visit um, that we went to Skidaway Island that Emily showed us around, after we left the phytoplankton lab, we uh, met Dr. Justin Manley in the oyster hatchery lab. He showed us around the lab and shared his vast knowledge and enthusiasm about oysters. So we looked at all those weird tanks from outer space and, um, whoops, I'm off on this one. Let's see. I'm out of sequence. Okay, we're going to skip then. So we'll go back to pearls in a minute. Or did I skip a page here? So, All right, so then um, phytoplankton lab, we saw this, and I always pronounce this, I always want to say triceriatum, triceriatum. So we um, saw this in the, I don't know if we saw it in the lab or you showed it to me in the book. But is that, does that shout carbon? You know, that carbon molecule right there incorporated in, in its body? And beautiful shape, just kind of a little bit of a bulging triangle. And um, in most of the images that are in books, it has a blue highlight in the tips. So I made this, um, and this is in the exhibit across the street. So I made this in copper, bronze, and cat, uh, copper, bronze, and um, brass. And um, those are blue topaz that are the highlights that are. And I don't, is that from the microscope that shows that, or is that in the creature? We'll call it a the chloroplast sounds good, a nice blue chloroplast. There's a close-up of that. All right, and this is um, from a book that's called Plankton, which um, is at, it was in the University of Georgia library. I saw it, and then I, I bought it because I absolutely love it. It's so many fabulous images in here that are inspiring. And this is the decorated Lorica of a Tintinid, and I just thought that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So I, I um, made a piece that references that. So again, um, all of the little pieces that are on there are silver and copper that have been textured and soldered or um, riveted on, or sometimes miniature screws and some cast pieces, and then the top copper part is hammered, sheet of copper, and um, pearls set on there to just make sure you know it comes from the sea. <laughs> uh, so this is in the exhibit also. And um, there's a call in the metalsmith community to um, have a piece that you've made, put it into context. So I photoshopped it into an aquarium, and I asked in Athens, Georgia, where there's a coral, um, 
store that is amazing. If anybody's from Athens, there's a, a coral, live coral um, store where they sell thousands of coral. And um, they said, no way that if I put that coral in the tank, it would hurt the coral. So of course, I didn't do that. So this is Photoshop. And I hope it's going to be in a magazine. Um, I'll let Emily know if it is juried in or not. You never know. OK, so then on that um, wonderful visit to Skidaway, uh, we went to meet Justin Manley at the Oyster Hatchery. And um, so then I took the information and read about oysters and submerged myself in them. And uh, they're such beautiful creatures. And I just, every one of them has a little different personality on their texture and the growth and the shape. Um, they're amazing. So I made probably 50 molds of different oysters and how to put them together. And, and um, so this is um, several oysters and mother of pearl is on there and little seaweed up on the top and um, pearls. And I saw on the inside of a lot of oysters, there's purple. And so I emailed Justin and said, what's the purple? And he said, it's melanin. And so I have amethyst in there to suggest that melanin. It, that's a fossil clamshell on the bottom, um, some, um, what do I have next? OK, uh, the bottom is supposed to look like sediment, so little air bubbles and, and molecules in there. That's copper, and then the, and then the um, carbon. All right, uh, then we ran into Dr. Alexander on that um, same trip. And um, he asked what we were doing on Skidaway and just was charming. And we talked about books. And then um, he said, oh, I think you need to see what Dr. Adam Greer is working on uh, in, in the lab there. And um, so they were filming Plankton in the Water. So Adam talked with us and showed us remarkable videos of his work and the beautiful, fragile plankton. The plankton pieces I've made for the exhibit are mounted on sheets of Lexan, which are pre printed with images from the videos that Adam Greer has created. So thank you, Adam, for giving me permission to use his images. So you'll see those in the show here, too. And look how beautiful these are. I mean, you could, this is inspiration for me for years. So here's, here's my dolyolid I made. So it's in the show, and uh, so I tried to replicate that beautiful little I guess those are babies on there, but that, that uh, wonderful pattern. OK, this is my last piece I'm going to show you. And um, this is the carbon cycle necklace. And here's a short definition of the carbon cycle from NOAA. Carbon's a chemical backbone of life on Earth. Carbon compounds regulate the Earth's temperature, make up the food that sustains us, and provides energy that fuels our global economy. Most of Earth's carbon is stored in rocks and sediments. The rest is located in the ocean, uh, in the atmosphere, and in living organisms. These are the reservoirs through which carbon cycles. The ocean plays a critical role in carbon storage, and it holds about 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere. OK, I tried to capture all that in this necklace. All right, the central section is a representation of water movement and currents in the ocean. And a grid of carbon molecules suggests the movement of carbon uh, in the cycle. The central stone is called Marston marble, but it's actually a limestone conglomerate of fossil ammonites from the Jurassic period. Um, the translucent black, we're going to go clockwise. The translucent um, black fleck stone, lepidocrosite, suggests plankton and marine snow. The silver branch of coral is set with diamond, pure carbon, and a bright blue sapphire, and cinnamon zircon, one of the oldest stones on Earth. Living coral has similar vibrant colors. The sun, there's my sun symbol again, plays a large role in the carbon cycle and is represented here by the rutilated quartz gemstone. The blue turquoise represents Earth. Earth's atmosphere with blue sky and clouds. The pyrite in quartz represents carbon stored in rock. Tube worms molded and cast here, each shell sequestering carbon. Next is a trilobite, that's the black element, uh, meaning three-lobed, an extinct marine arthropod. Trilobites were the most successful of all early animals existing in oceans for almost 270 million years. Uh, the blue topaz 
is carved with a hexagonal pattern suggesting carbon. The black diamond is pure carbon, the green algae and the green yellow orange stone color change sphene, which is down toward the bottom, appears to me to combine the energy of the sun and the nutrients of the plankton. Um, the marine carbon cycle is a remarkable process that sustains life on Earth, regulating the planet's climate and supporting a diverse range of marine ecosystems. By understanding and appreciating this vital process, we can foster a deeper connection to our oceans and recognize our responsibility to protect and preserve them for generations to come. Thank you, Georgia Sea Grant. Thank you, Skidaway Institute of Oceanography. And thank you, University of Georgia. And thank you all for coming. Across the parking lot with us, and we can check out the exhibit and ask for any questions you may have. Water, actually, yeah. 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 Yeah